Hello, Revision. Hello, Twitch. Hello, the Internet. Hello, fellow demo seniors. I'm Ned Poet. I'm an attorney at law in Germany. I specialize in IT law, including data protection. And you might know me from either one of the previous seminars or the CNET Org Awards years ago, or from winning last year's Revision Streaming Music Competition. Welcome to this seminar of mine called GDPR Gold Standard or Disaster of the Century. Now, with the coronavirus spreading, um, I know Disaster of the Century is probably a little far-fetched. As you will find out, the title was not created knowing that the virus would come, and it's also been a couple of years ago that that happened. I also said in the description of this seminar that the GDPR was firmly applauded by some, heavily criticized by others, understood by few, and cursed by many. And I think that still holds true, even though I have to give the GDPR some credit. As you'll figure out, a lot of blame that the GDPR has to take has nothing to do with her. It. Now, um, things are a little different this year. Revision is more remote vision, and um, we're doing all the seminars uh, pre-recorded. This is two. So as you're seeing this live, I will be in the chat round, uh, chat room answering questions, but you'll see a pre-recorded video, so I cannot visually uh, answer your questions as we're discussing them. Let's get to work. Why am I covering this topic? Well, last year I did talk quite a bit about the GDPR, but um, now a lot of people have more experience with it. And there is also um, a very uh, official reason to talk about this. Now, um, what I'll be talking about regarding the GDPR will probably have a slight German focus. Um, a lot of literature about the GDPR is in German and or from Germany. Um, so if you have a different approach from a different member state of the EU or even abroad, uh, please, please include me in it. Uh, please approach me about it. We might be doing something together um, in a further year. When I refer to articles in this talk without spe uh, specifying the law, I always refer to the GDPR. And we have little time, so please excuse me uh, just hand and cherry picking certain examples to convey my point. Um, we don't have much time. A bird's eye view will have to do for now. So why am I covering this topic? Well, for one, I think it's interesting. Um, but also, as I said, um, there is also an official reason to evaluate the GDPR, and that is Article 97. Now, Article 97, as you can see, says by May 25th, 2020, that's in roughly a month, and every four years thereafter, the Commission shall submit a report on the evaluation, yada, yada, yada. So the public um, will get um, a report on this, um, and um, I can show you in a minute what the EU Commission thinks about the GDPR, but that's the official reason why we're doing this. Let's get back. So um, I didn't want to just tell you what I think. I wanted to know what you thought. So last Wednesday, I published on Twitter this saying, if you could change anything about the GDPR, what would it be? And here are some results. A lot of people, um, and the first part is summarized because I, because I got so much feedback that I had to categorize it and act and to be honest, a lot of feedback uh, revolved around one aspect alone or several aspects of that aspect. So um, it's quite um, it's quite obvious that a lot of you folks out there hate having to handle cookies online these days. So um, a lot of people say uh, you hate having to approve cookies being set. You're bothers um, and sometimes uh, uh, you're bothered by having to uh, opt out of cookies. A lot of times uh, you criticize that it's usually or oftentimes more difficult to opt out of cookies than to opt in. Um, some of you want a reject all option. That was a pretty popular uh, reply too. Someone just wants stricter rules um, on how to communicate cookies details. Um, and one of you said that cookies should be illegal and 
like illegal full stop because no no cookies are necessary. I don't agree on this, but that's what we got. And um, another thing that I clearly understood from your feedback was understanding that the, 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 the understanding the GDPR is obviously a problem. Um, some want the GDPR just to be comprehensible for non-lawyers in the first place. Some say nobody has understood it. Um, so pe some people are afraid, others are angry. And I concur. I, I second that. Um, if you don't understand something and you have to basically study it, Uh, in, um, at great lengths in order to understand it, there I think there is something wrong. Um, and one one of my friends said, uh, personally, I don't, 99% of the time, I couldn't care much less, but he also ends up saying that, I'll get out of the way here, uh, the GDPR is not written so that you can clearly see what's okay and what isn't. And I think that alone is a problem, and I second that too. Now, ironically enough, Your input on cookies didn't even touch the GDPR. I'll get to why um, in this talk too uh, at the end, but your criticism, I'm sorry, as much as I'm sorry to say it, didn't touch the GDPR. So be patient, we'll get to that. Now, but how does the EU Commission see the GDPR? I mean, if the EU Commission initiated this, um, how do they think they're doing with the GDPR? And let's have a look. There is an official uh, statement on it. The official report on it um, will still follow. But last year, as you can see, on the 24th of July 2019, there was a communication um, titled Data Protection Rules as a Trust Enabler in the EU and Beyond Taking Stock. And uh, it's a pretty lengthy report. Um, but there is um, one a uh, uh, paragraph in the introduction that I think is remarkable, um, and that is the EU data protection legislative framework is a cornerstone of the European human-centric approach to innovation. It is becoming part of the regulatory floor, floor for which, uh, for a widening range of policies, da, 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 da. Um, At the time of this communication, a lot of progress has been made towards this objective, although more work is certainly needed for the regulation to become fully operational. Just saying. So why I uh, chose the title is uh, because I didn't make it up. A gold standard and disaster of the century had already been taken. Gold standard has been used by various lawyers and politicians, amongst which um, are the previous federal German data protection officer, Dr. Shah, also a person you might call the godfather of the GDPR. It probably doesn't give enough credit to the other people involved, but um, the, the Hamburg-based uh, member of parliament and lawyer Jan Philipp Albrecht also calls it that, and Martin Selmayr, um, head of the European Commission representation in Vienna, also calls it that, as you can see here. So here is Dr. Peter Shah saying it, gold standard, um, Jan Philipp Albrecht says the GDPR is already now the gold standard, and Martin Selmayr says it in English, uh, in English even. Europe must have uh, the confidence to set the new global digital standards. The general data protection regulation is a gold standard for privacy and proof that the EU can be a rule maker rather than a rule taker when it comes to the digital economy. Now, while I think that still needs to be proven, um, I'm just providing feedback at this point. Disaster of the century is a pretty famous quote from another German lawyer, I admit, and that is uh, Professor Dr. Thomas Hören um, from the University of Münster in Germany at the Euroforum uh, Data Protection Congress in 2000, 2016 already. Um, he calls it the biggest catastrophe of the 21st century. And I just took the liberty to um, translate it to disaster. Now, 
I think there are a couple of circles of problems with the GDPR. And as we're only doing a couple and we have little time, I'll just, I just picked a few and I want to give you an idea what I think should be different or what is problematic with the GDPR. Accountability reaches far, very far. And that is because Article 5, Paragraph 2 of the uh, the GDPR basically forces you as a controller, if you process personal data, not only for your private, strictly private life, um, you need to be responsible for and um, be able to uh, uh, demonstrate compliance with all the principles that you see in Paragraph 1. Now, Paragraph 1... Um, I'll just list the principles here uh, roughly, uh, includes stuff like lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. So all the you have to apply all the rules that uh, deal with uh, fairness, transparency. You have to adhere, had, adhere to all the privacy, the data protection laws. Uh, you have to limit the purposes. So if you have data, you may only use it for a certain purpose, and you may only collect it for a specific purpose to begin with. You have to minimize the data, so so persons may only be identifiable for as long as the originally or the, the current purpose indicates it. Data has to be accurate, and you have to also keep it up to date. And um, the storage has to be limited, meaning the, uh, the, uh, I, the uh, data subjects um, concerned may only be identifiable for as long as uh, as necessary. Also, you have to keep your data in uh, integer and confidential. That is probably usually an information security topic that most of you might be familiar with, and that's relatively easy to, uh, to comply with. And remember that this doesn't just mean that you have to do all this. It means that you have to be able to prove that you do all this. And I can tell you that just adhering to these principles is difficult enough, especially for smaller and medium-sized businesses even sometimes, not to even speak of nonprofit organizations, but being able to prove, to document that you do all this um, is quite a challenge, especially for smaller controllers. Now, what are the underlying causes? Um, I think there are a couple. To begin with, I think the all or nothing approach that the GDPR has is a problem because basically, and I, this is not in the GDPR, but um, the GDPR approaches from the standpoint that all personal data is potentially dangerous or could be mis or abused. So you may only process in general all the personal data that you, you need for a specific purpose. Neither purpose nor context of the data use is relevant. Um, so relevant for the question whether data protection rules apply or don't apply. And um, I'll get to why that is difficult as well. So it's either all or nothing. Like if you have a personal datum, all this applies. And if you don't, it doesn't. It has no, it doesn't play any role what you use it for if the individual concerned in the, in the specific case is at risk of anything. And I'll also tell you why in a minute. Why does it matter? I meant. And also, the all or nothing approach doesn't even allow for pseudonym, pseudonymization, pseudonymization um, to to get rid of all this. It doesn't even weaken um, the, the approach. So just to make sure that you understand, if you anonymize data, it's you cannot identify a person at all anymore. If, however, you just give out a pseudonym, meaning like an identifier or something, um, you're still in it and all the, the principles of the GDPR apply, it makes no difference really. And I think it should, um, but that's just my very personal opinion. Controllers face numerous obligations um, depending on whether it's personal or not. And there is no, there's no gradual approach to anything. The only like second level that you can, you can get to is specific um, special categories of personalized data, meaning, uh, for example, health data or political views, sexual orientation, stuff like that. Those things are especially protected. And I'll get to why um, that can be problematic in practice in a second. 
The second approach that I think is problematic is the one size fits all approach. And that means the co- if you are a controller, you have the same obligations in principle as every other controller. Um, no matter what your business volume is, no matter how big you are, how many employees you have, um, regardless of your size, all of this doesn't matter what you process personal data for. Yes, of course, in specific in specific cases, the 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 uh, the ob- obligations that you have to fulfill can be different, but the one size fits all approach doesn't distinguish whether you are uh, Google, Amazon, Facebook, or Apple, or the like, or a nonprofit chess club um, in your neighborhood. And I think that is problematic because that is asking too much of certain um, concerned individuals or controllers. And also the GDPR, and the fact that that doesn't distinguish anything is even more interesting because the GDPR, and uh, at least allegedly to a lot of statements that you would hear at the time, um, originated with the idea um, to limit especially the options that large controllers have, like GAFA. And for, at this point, uh, it rather seems the opposite way around, so that GAFA and the like, because they're so big, are relatively um, easy with uh, spending big budgets on compliance with the GDPR, whereas many smaller controllers just cannot do that. So all in all, the GDPR seems to have brought much ado for all participants, but little perceivable benefit. Examples of what the GDPR isn't really ready for. And this is also something, it's a, it's a circle of problems um, that it spreads over the entire GDPR. I'm just telling you this to give you an idea why the GDPR um, should probably be rethought in certain areas. And so one, for example, is blockchains. If you have a blockchain, you better don't save any, uh, store any personal data in it because uh, the data subjects have the right to re- to uh, demand erasure of that data. And if you have a blockchain, usually there is no way to delete it. That alone is a problem. If you are trying to make health-related apps or even use it, um, you will see that you will be asked for consent most of the time. Now, in the times in the time of Corona and all the tracking apps that are out there, you see that consent will be asked for um, a lot of times um, because whether you're infected or not is a health datum, which is especially protected, and and so. The fact that you're asked for consent is legally required by the GDPR because a lot of other legal bases don't work in this case with because of that type of, of data. But it also blurs your vision on what's really relevant. If you have an app like that, you should be able to trust as, a, as an individual, as a citizen, you should be able to trust that even though, even if you consent to the use of the app, the the provider of the app should still be um, obliged to adhere to certain data minimization principles, which in theory they are. But I'm saying your vision on all of this is blurred because they ask you for permission and you should be um, you should be careful whenever anyone asks you for permission, unless in theory it deals with health related data. So it's difficult to to even approach this. Another problem area is language assistance. Language assistance, like you know Alexa or Google Echo or things like that, will process your data but cannot give you a privacy statement. So if you wanted to know more about your privacy, um, what should the language assistant do? Just read out pages and pages of privacy statements? Don't think so. It's very impractical, and you would have to have a medium break. Um, to or a media break to figure out what happens with your data. And so language assistants are very tricky to deal with, as is artificial intelligence. It's really difficult to figure out who's even responsible once you have a strong AI. I'm not talking about the programs with sensors, you know, stuff that you can you can check and control and then reprogram if you want. I'm talking of strong AI. Once you have that, who's the controller? Who's responsible to maintain privacy or data protection? Difficult. The GDPR has no answer to that yet. 
And it's pretty much the, uh, pretty much similar to the language assistance. It's the Internet of Things thing. You, in many cases, you have no no visual interface, uh, just a programming interface. You have no possibility to see your privacy statements, figure out what's going on. Internet of Things 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 with Internet difficult. Also, something that the GDPR apparently didn't see coming. And as if that wasn't enough already, have you ever wondered what the GDPR is actually trying to protect? And that question might baffle you. And it actually, it baffled me the first time I heard about this. Why are we doing all this? What does the GDPR want? What is the subject of protection? What does the GDPR want to protect? And you would think it's something like privacy or secrecy, maybe private life, something like that. But um, that is all not in the GDPR. But you, if you look closely, you will see that the term rights and freedoms um, as a subject for protection appears 66 times in the GDPR. And um, if you if you watch from Germany, you will have heard the term of, of informational self determination. It's something from a from a, a Supreme Court um, Supreme Court decision from the eighties, the Volkszählungsurteil. All that is really, if you're honest, off the table now because informational self determination doesn't appear in the GDPR at all. It's just in our weird German heads anymore. It's not what the GDPR wants, and <clears throat> in, in many cases, it would also lead to very odd evaluations if it was. But to get an idea um, what data protection is for, where it comes from, let's have a look at the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. In Article 7 and 8, you see in, in their titles things like respect for private and family life. And in Article 8, you see protection of personal data. But so what does this mean? Article 7 says everyone has the right to respect for his or her private and family life, home and communication. Okay, we'll see why that is really a different aspect than traditional data protection. And Article 8 says everyone has the right to the protection of personal data concerning him or her. And such data must be processed fairly for specified purposes on the basis of consent of the person concerned or some other legitimate basis like legitimate interest, things like that, laid down by law. Everyone has the right to access to data um, which is also something that can be quite problematic in many practical uh, cases, which has been collected concerning him or her and the right to have it rectified. Compliance with these rules shall be subject to control by an independent authority. So there you have it, why we have independent, uh, independent supervisory authorities. Now, um, in Germany, we have a lot because every state has them and the the, the Republic itself has another one. So we have many. That's not the case in many other countries, but there you have it. So what the GDPR aims to protect is really rights and freedoms. And if you think this through, it means in the practical concordance, meaning you have to evaluate what fundamental rights apply in which area and, and we all have them. So we have uh, the, the freedom in theory and in general to go out and do as we please unless we commit, for example, a crime or we invade anyone else's fundamental right too much. So really it's this sort of evaluation that we do all the time, but with the GDPR protecting all rights and freedoms, what we really did is creating a fundamental superpower with the GDPR. Because all rights and freedoms, not even only the concerned person, but pretty much all natural persons in many cases, um, this has grown way out of proportion, I think. And if you don't specify why we do all this, it's very difficult to evaluate in specific cases what fundamental right or what other right should prevail. And the fear of sanctions, this is another principle that I find quite problematic or another uh, phenomenon, I should say. 
the fear of sanctions, fines and prosecution even, has led to many participants not processing data even though they would actually be allowed to. And that is called chilling effects. What this has done in practice, in practice is a lot of people who should be protected, meaning all rights and freedoms to utter your opinion, to, to express yourself artistically, to do journalistic work, a lot of people are not doing that anymore or are doing it differently because of the GDPR, because they're afraid of sanctions that the GDPR has introduced or, let's say, emphasized. Those chilling effects are problematic. And I'm sure you've seen many of these things. Just if you want to look, um, go to Twitter and check, uh, check the hashtag uh, X-Files GDPR and you'll see tons of this. Um, uh, pictures of minors in kindergarten and school, stuff like that. Prayers, um, like masses are not transmitted anymore on the internet, things like that. And it's just like petty little details that are blown way out of proportion in the media. And the legal layman lose any idea of proportion for what data protection was supposed to do, does now, and who's who or what is to blame. Now, about this cookies topic from earlier, e-privacy. It's really an e-privacy topic. Yeah, it's not the same as data protection. And as much as I like to criticize the GDPR, the fact that you have to consent to cookies pretty much everywhere you go online today has nothing to do with the GDPR. The cookies consent origin is the e-privacy directive. And it's basically required whenever a cookie is not n strictly necessary, meaning, for example, for a shopping basket to, to work, or if you want to uh, administer a browsing session, things like that, you just have to do that. Now, if you think, well, wait a minute, wasn't the e-privacy directive to, supposed to be replaced? Yes, it was. It hasn't, and it's not going to be in the next years, but at ultimately, probably at some point, the e-privacy directive was supposed to be replaced by the e-privacy regulation to the same date, 25th of May, 2018, as a GDPR, but they couldn't manage to do that. It still hasn't passed legislation, and it's unlikely to do that until at least the end of 2021, meaning with a two-year period, a waiting period, um, it won't be in force until probably the end of 2023. Fate of cookies and the consent nightmare, unclear. But something else is bothering me too, coming back to data protection, and that is even the title and many stipulations in the e-privacy regulation. I'll keep this short because we don't have time, but the title of the proposal for the e-privacy regulation was this in 2017. It might change at some point, but at the time it was that. Regulation concerning the respect for private life, okay? And the protection of personal data in electronic communications. So it sounds like it is a data protection regulation when, and while that is not entirely wrong, it conveys, I th in my humble opinion, a super wrong idea because and a lot of politicians also don't seem to understand the e-privacy regulation is not supposed to be the little sibling of the GDPR. And yet, I think in EU legislation, that's exactly what it's being abused and misused for. You have to understand that in the making of the GDPR, there were years of negotiations in the EU, um, in the Commission, in the Parliament. And the fact that and that fact alone led to a lot of delay and a lot of things just didn't make it into the GDPR. And now, allegedly and apparently, a lot of people are trying to stuff the things that they couldn't get into the GDPR to now uh, in, into the e-privacy regulation now, which I think is super problematic. If you want to know more about this and speak German, have a look at the just published Legal Bits 31 that I did with Dr. Simon Asian of Bird and Bird here in Frankfurt, who's a much better expert, expert at 
um, uh, telecommunication data protection. Um, I'll just keep it brief here. Well, at this point, however, all that we have um, is a draft and we have the e-privacy directive that, as sorry as I am to say it, just asks uh, all of us to consent to cookies everywhere where they're not strictly necessary. Let's hope for the best. So, which is it? Gold standard or disaster of the century? Well, um, I think it's neither, um, but the GDPR probably leaves some room, uh, room for improvement. Uh, I think too many questions need professional advice to be answered. Um, and as data protection just pretty much concerns all personal data, really, I mean, really all data, because most of it is, um, basics and fundamental questions shouldn't be difficult to understand and handle, I think. Speaking of hope, uh, some lawyer colleagues also gave feedback to my tweet. Uh, which I'm very happy for, and I don't want to keep this from you. If you want to follow lawyers' ideas on how to improve the GDPR, and maybe if you even want to contribute yourself, um, uh, check out the Twitter hashtag uh, BetterGDPR, and let's have a look what they say. One wanted to extend the household exemption to communicative activities and non-commercial activities of natural persons. And if you have no idea what that means, then just understand this. You may use personal data for your private, strictly private life, but as soon as you publish anything on the internet, let's say Twitter, Facebook, you publish it so that everyone can read it, you're in the GDPR. But if you don't, you're not. And what they want to do here is ex extend this household communication, uh, household exemption to anything communicative activity, non-commercial by a natural person, which I think makes perfect sense. Thank you, Winfried. Another guy, and I'm not quite sure if they're a lawyer, um, but I, I would think that this is so legal that I would think it might very well be. They wanted to reduce the possibility to use legitimate interests as legal basis. So in, pra in practice, that would mean you would have to ask much more for consent. I don't really second that. I have no time to go into details of to why. But I think legitimate interests and a certain level of, of checks and balances as to what you should be able to do automatically without explicit consent um, should be bigger, that those borders should be widened. Um, and you should also have, a, you should have as a, as a consumer and as a natural person, you should have to be able to trust whether someone um, may actually uh, process your personal data without, without having to consent everything. Because let's face it, we all consent to stuff all the time without reading it. I do too. And another colleague of mine said, we should uh, extend the freedom of processing except for well-founded limitations. So what he wants to do is turn it around and say, if I understand that correctly, turn it around and say, we should not act as if any processing of any personal data is a problem unless we found a justification for it. But we should turn it around and say, um, it's in theory and uh, in principle allowed unless we have certain well-founded limitations. So it's basically turning it upside down. Um, I'm sure that the G GDPR isn't really ready for it, but I think it's a thought very well worth having and discussing. And another piece of final um, feedback that I got was uh, someone would concretize Article 85, Paragraph 1 within the GDPR itself, not leave it entirely to the member states. So if you want to have a look what that means, let's go and check out Article 85. Let's see what we've got. Ah, how do I do that? Oh, give me a second, 85, here we go. So 85 paragraph one basically states that member states should have the freedom um, to come up with national laws as to uh, the execution of rights to freedom of expression and information, 
journalistic purposes and the purposes of academic, artistic, and literary expressions. That means what they would do is take this out and not have the member states decide what should be allowed for journalistic purposes, artistic purposes, uh, for execution of freedom of expression, and so on. And I think that's um, very well worth um, considering. Um, I think the the uh, EU Commission had good reason to put it like this, but just so you know, I think um, that's a thought well worth having. So, to round this off, the GDPR has left too many fundamental questions unanswered, I think, and many actors frustrated, especially those who try really hard to comply. Um, we have chilling effects, with which I think is a problem. A law that was supposed to extend the rights, that a law that is supposed to extend the rights and freedoms of all natural persons, is now limiting them because they're afraid of sanctions. Those chilling effects are a big problem. And in spite of huge budgets that a lot of companies have spent on GDPR compliance, um, neither. Can I say that, like, basically, let's say 80% or more of the companies are actually complying quite well with the GDPR, nor do I think that the public actually feels any better protected than before. If you have a different view on this or the same view, please share it in the chat with me. I also see that the supervisory authorities are still overloaded with work, no matter that they got new staff. Um, it's no wonder because the GDPR gave them a lot of additional tasks and they still cannot control full range compliance with the GDPR. They just can't. So what they do is they basically make examples that, in my opinion, come across quite oddly sometimes because of fines way higher than I would have expected them. Um, we still have to see the outcome of the court proceedings that follow up on these. Um, but the, the proportion of the activities that you see from supervisory authorities and the effect that it, they seem to have are quite off in my experience. And um, as you could clearly see, e-privacy is currently contributing to confusing everyone, even though it has little to do with the GDPR style data protection, meaning, yes, telecommunications has a different data protection sector, um, but it confuses people all the time. And, I th and I'm hoping that the EU Commission isn't making it worse with the, with the e-privacy regulation to come. Thank you for your um, watching this video, but also thank you to Gizmo Fabranche for providing the, the awesome video background that you're seeing here. Uh, thank you also to Raphael and Hubert for helping me uh, producing this video with equipment and help and lighting and all the stuff that I wouldn't have been able to, to do without them. So thank you a lot. Also, thank you to the guys who make OBS Studio. I think it's quite awesome. No questions. And uh, everyone whose valuable input I could use for the use of this, uh, this video, this seminar presentation. Thank you very much. And last but certainly not, uh, not least, everyone uh, out here partying with us this year at Remote Vision. Thank you very much. Have a good night and let's party like it's 1999.